Welcome back to the tasting room. I just realized I forgot what number of episode this is, but we're glad you came back for it because this is going to be a lot of if fun. If you don't know what number it is, just count with us. I want to say thirteen. I think thirteen sounds right. Yeah, Friday the thirteenth. We're, we're just going to we're just going to call it thirteen. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Been a minute, but we're uh, we're nearing. I'm going to do this at the end too. We're nearing St. Patrick's Day, so go to the Shamrock Bash at Cabin Boys Brewery. It'll be really cool. We'll have uh, I think three different bands. We'll have bagpipes. We'll have dancers. That's awesome. And a lot of cool stuff. Seventeen so. seventeen East Seventh Street. Street. Yep. Look so, at me. Or just say Seventh in Utica. Or that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in the same parking lot as American Solera. In what used to be 1907 Barbecue, shout out to those guys for going to Mother yep. Road Market. Um, yeah, but that's going to be a lot of fun, so definitely check that out. Yeah, I'm we'll sure have the worst I will be there. and yeah. Kilkenny's that's awesome. uh, serving food at the brewery that day. All right, you want to introduce who we got today? Yeah, so, uh, man, this podcast is really fun, especially for me because it's a, uh, with two, two friends uh, David McLean, who is my head brewer, which is our first guest from our from brewery. Yeah, yeah, so that's really cool. Yeah. And then we've got Dustin. Dustin Patterson. Uh, Patterson yeah. from Balcones uh, down in Waco, Texas. Right and One of that was really cool. Heads, he, yeah. he, he shed a lot of light on a, a few different things about whiskey and why th- single malt is called single malt. Yeah. Uh, that was actually the first time that I think that I've had a professional describe that to me. Which was really cool. And we talked about your love of a, of a specific musician. Yeah. Uh, maybe we should... Which has nothing uh, to do with this. No, yeah. no, no, no. No. You'll have to listen to that. That's foreshadowing. Yeah, it's at the very end. It's at the very end. You'll yeah. have to listen to a very funny personal story uh, that David tells about uh, our history during COVID. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's fun. Let's get, right, let's get right into it, if I can speak English. That's right. I do better on the actual interview, but we'll be right back with that after the break. Cheers. Hey, I'm John. I'm one of the partners here at Grassfire Creative. We are a production company. We do animation, video production, live production, anything you need to creatively tell both your story and your business's story. Along with the content that we create, we also provide the strategy behind how to get it in front of the eyeballs that matter to you. We're located right in the middle of the United States in Tulsa, Oklahoma, so no matter where you are, we're just a short flight away. Bottom line is we are very excited to both meet you and tell your business's story. Please do reach out to us one of the ways below via email or phone number and check out more about us at our website, grassfirecreative.com. Well, welcome back to the tasting room. It's been a while since we've re- recorded one it feels of these. Like it, yeah, it? and I've got two people here to introduce uh, Dustin and David McLean. David McLean is our head brewer, and Dustin, what is your official job at Balcones? I'm the production manager. Okay, Ooh. and sometimes brewer. <laughs> hey. Right on. And uh, why are you here today? I'm here to collab with you guys, brewing a beer today. Uh, we, we already did brew a beer today, mostly brewed. And uh, yeah, British Golden Ale with uh, some Golden Promise malted barley, which is our favorite at Balcones. So. I'm excited for that. Yeah, it's going to be good. Um, so before we get started with questions, do you want to give us the background of how you got into the spirit world? Sure, yeah. So Balcones started in 2008. We've been around, I guess, 14 years now. I've been with Balcones for the last five uh, mostly mashing and fermentation, um, done a little bit of distilling, done zero blending. I'll let the experts <laughs> handle that. Um, but yeah, we focus on uh, American single malt whiskey. We also do some bourbon and some corn whiskey as well, a little bit of rye, a um, tad bit of rum, but tad mostly just rum. because Speaking we like of, it so much. Yeah, yeah exactly. I knew you were going to bring the whiskey, <laughs> so I brought a, uh, a barrel pick, basically, of rum from Ranch Acres, a liquor store here in town. So um yeah, so I'll, uh, I'll let you ask the first question. I'm curious, should we start with rum or should we start with whiskey, palate-wise? Um, I'd say let's start with rum. Okay, I'll yeah. pour this as, as Austin asks a question, and then we can get going. Yeah, so to uh, just kind of get you into what we do, uh, we normally ask about six different questions. We kind of fudge on that a little bit. Uh, we might ask a lot of bunny trail questions, mm, but lot, we yeah. six main questions, and uh, we we bounce back and forth from John and I. Uh, so, one of the things that we talk about here on this podcast is very Tulsa centric so far, uh, and so you're our first guest that's 
completely outside of the realm of Ooh, Oklahoma. That's true. Yeah. So that's really cool. Congratulations. But, Thank uh, you. Honored. You know, as an easy warm up question, I want to know what your first impression was because you, you kind of gave me a synopsis of the difference between coming into Oklahoma and the differences of, of our cultures here uh, going from Oklahoma City to Tulsa. What, what was it when you felt coming into Tulsa? And what, what did your family think about this area at first? Sure, yeah. Well, you know, being Texans, of course, we're arrogant. Uh, we think that uh, no. everything is about Texas and that anything outside of Texas must therefore be inferior. Uh, and so we had certain preconceived notions about what we expected Oklahoma to be like and uh, broadly in Tulsa in particular. And yeah, we went up through Oklahoma City, you know, the big city, right? Um, we kind of expected something along the lines of what we're used to with DFW. Um, and yeah, sure, it was it was you know, a big kind of spread out a lot of people. Um, we saw the basketball arena and kind of went, okay, this is, you know, we, we know what to expect here. And then when we showed up in Tulsa, we were shocked at how cool everything mm. was. The architecture, uh, the facades of all the buildings were just like really interesting and unique. Um, lots of great artwork on the sides of buildings. And then every business we've gone into from coffee shops to bars to restaurants have all been really, really impressive and just yeah, shocking to us because, you know, uh, you know, we may be arrogant that we're from Texas, but we're from Waco, Texas, which has <laughs> historically been a very hey, small there's, town. there's nymphos <laughs> and there's crickets. Oh, yeah. Uh, you got some diving yeah, Mexican some, joints, yeah, yeah, yeah. for sure. Yeah. But, uh, but, yeah, the, I mean, the, the bars, restaurants, food here is awesome. Mm, yeah. And but, brewery, okay, so say. we also have uh, David here, who is the first person from my company to sit as a guest that is true which is really this cool this is a podcast of first yeah it's yeah. A, it, which is really cool and the reason why i wanted you to be here is because you and dustin have a pretty cool history and also i think that you could answer the question yourself because you're basically from the waco area that's what I was about to ask. you nodded when i said nymphos yeah. so i figured you had to be from down yeah. there or spent time down there i spent yeah. a few days in waco okay. texas All right. yeah All right. yeah yeah you can fault me there there you go <laughs> there you go uh yeah so i am i'm the first uh employee of cabin boys to be on so thanks this is fun of Lots course of fun it's been fun to listen and now also be at the table does it feel uh, different than you thought it would? Does, yeah. yeah it does. Is there a little bit more lights involved? You in know, it? mostly it's the microphones. <laughs> yeah. Hey, cheers, by the way. We <laughs> yeah, can, we can cheers, start sipping cheers. on this. Thanks for coming on, cheers, guys. guys. I do love rum. Rum's so cool. It has this really sweet. Well, fuck, with the price of whiskey it. these days, like you might as well I'm start saying. buying yeah, I mean, rum right, or tequila yeah. or and get it something. now before it goes up too, honestly, you know. Honestly. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone's gonna catch on soon enough mm -hmm. and they'll be Spending sixty dollars a bottle on rum. Oh, so know. much vanilla and just goodness out of that. Yeah, this is great. Did you talk about it. this rum? No, I haven't. Okay, so and you have a story about this too, which I'll, I'll let you talk about privateer. And you're not um, going to get out of that question. No, no, no. We'll, we'll come back to that. So this is batch one. So it's a it's a barrel pick that they did, single batch selection. Only two hundred and fifteen bottles produced, um, and that's really, to be perfectly honest, all I know about it. It looks like it's a collab between Valkyrie and we've had Aaron Post on because their logo's oh, cool. on here. And then Ranch Acres as well, and Saturn Room is on there as well, which is, that makes sense. They have a bunch yeah. of rum. Um, but yeah. And Does you were telling me you were teaching a class? Is that uh, right? Not teaching, no, very much learning. Okay. okay. Uh, yeah. So Maggie Campbell, their uh, former head distiller, um, her name may be on the bottle, depending on how old this is, um, they're up in Massachusetts, and um, she is very involved in WSET, um, which is a mm. wine and spirits education um, course. And uh, we're actually, yeah, in a class together right now with, um, she, she uh, is more on the educator end of things. Gotcha. I'm very much more on the learning end of things. Um, but yeah, she's brilliant. She's at Mount Gay now, um, knows a ton about rum. Before that, she was doing brandy uh, on the West Coast. Mm. And um, yeah, she knows tons about spirits. She's phenomenal. What does your, you know, refined palate <laughs> tell you about this, about this single <laughs> cask rum? <laughs> Uh, let's see. Uh, so I drink beer mostly. There you so, go. Uh, there you go. This one is super strong. <laughs> Hundred nineteen point four proof, which hey, no, for me is on the low side. That is on the low side. <laughs> At least six. I've or been seven bringing points. in one twenties, one thirties. Did I tell you the one of the whiskey groups I'm in? Pretty soon, up for like buy or whatever you want to call that for you know reserving a bottle is a hundred and fifty four proof. Whoa. Yeah. 
I don't know that. I'm debating if I want to pull the trigger on that because that's that's drinking fire. I mean, it's got to be like putting napalm down your throat, right? Like, wow. I mean, that just sounds. Yeah. So Balcona is we release a lot of cast proof, okay. cast proof yeah. uh, spirits, and yeah, in Texas in particular, like Angel Share is insane. So mm. um, we're just we've got um, we lose a ton of water, and we we've, we've definitely bottled stuff 150 proof really? before, just because that's yeah. Uh, we Man. just lose so much water, the ABV goes through the roof. Mm. So we drink cast drink stuff around the distillery all the time. So I'm used to drinking yeah. um, high proof spirits, but uh, yeah, it's certainly not my forte. Sure, sure. I, I, I like a I like a lager. Well, we do have <laughs> yeah. some like beers here. Uh, re ask <laughs> your question. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I want to know. Uh, I want people to hear what your experience was coming from uh, where you're at and from Texas and coming up and. Uh, explain to how you you actually got a, uh, a audience of an interview at Cabin Boys. Yeah, so uh, I am from Texas. Uh, my dad was a high school football coach in Texas. Well, that's so big it's, time. It's hard to that's get more celebrity. Texan than me. Yeah. yeah, he's actually from Pecos, Texas, Pecos. which there's not a town in Texas that sounds more Texan that's than P-E-C-O-S, Pecos. That's P E C O S, right? That's right. Yep. Uh, I grew up in Dallas, so we have three. Are you Texan as well? We're probably, probably 30. thirty-seven okay. hours away yeah. from Dallas it's a long West. Way. It's maybe, a long maybe, way. maybe hundred and ten. <laughs> you know, uh, I'm not from Pecos, but my dad was from Pecos. High school football coach. Moved around a lot, uh, so I'm used to that. But I feel very Texan. Mm. Did college in Waco. Uh, married my wife and went back to Waco, uh, and uh, so moved on up to be near her family in 2018. Uh, she has a brother who started a coffee shop with a buddy in town, and it has now become a very successful coffee shop. Uh, Cirque Coffee does phenomenal. I was going to say, work. I yeah. now see the. Yep. Okay. Because uh, we have the guys on yeah, from Cirque. So, they yeah. are awesome guys and do really, really, really phenomenal coffee. Uh, so uh, my brother-in-law uh, knew when I was coming in town, moving to Tulsa, that I wanted to work in beer. And uh, he gave me a personal tour to every brewery owner he knew in town. And one day walked me into the doors, the garage doors, of Cabin Boys Brewery. (laughs) And they were in the middle of a work day. And my brother-in-law, just John Pierce, walked me straight into the production (laughs) area and shook Austin McElroy's hand and said, looked him in the uh, blue eyes of (laughs) Austin (laughs) McElroy and piercing said, blue eyes. Piercing, yeah, piercing. <laughs> I've got somebody you need to interview. And he introduced me there. And uh, I was so embarrassed. Good night. <laughs> you don't walk into somebody. But you killed the interview. Well, 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 yeah. you'll have to ask Austin. I do have a job. I mean, that's somehow. what I mean. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we we hired him as a bartender at that point in time. Almost. What Was it full time at first or was it part time? I or was what, looking what, what? for hours. So yeah. it, was, it was full time bartender. Yeah. And then, and then you kind of worked your way into production, uh, half and half bartender production. There's a and little then, extra there. It was like half and <coughs> half and a quarter and a half. Yeah, <laughs> and then uh, and and then you became head brewer. What about a year ago? About a year ago. Right on. Cool. That's awesome. Um, so I have a bunch of questions about Texas whiskey and um, just. I mean, we kind of talked about how the prices and just just the whole industry, right? Sure. So let's start with, uh, I think for people that, that hear of bourbon, they think of Kentucky. Sure. Right? Like that's the mecca for, and I, I'm going to ask you about why that is too, but how have you seen the Texas whiskey market grow or how whiskey is accepted in Texas? Because I mean, as we were talking about, Texas is a very proud state. Right. So I'm sure Texans love drinking Texas products. Of course. But how have you seen the, the Texas whiskey kind of be accepted down there? Yeah, I mean, like you said, with, with bourbon, uh, a lot of people, uh, especially if they don't live in Texas, will see a Texas whiskey on the shelf. And we're, I think we're in 47 states now or something and in, in, in the EU and uh, Australia. And I think when people see Texas, especially our bourbon, which this is not, but uh, we do have a bourbon. They'll, oh, go, awesome. yeah. they'll go, Texas bourbon? That doesn't make any sense. I'm not buying that. Uh, but, you know, bourbon just has to be 51% corn. Right, Asian it's about the bill. Oak, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so it can be, you know, anywhere in the U.S. It can be manufactured anywhere in the U.S. So I think that aside from Kentucky, Texans are doing very well because, like you said, mm-hmm. Texans are very proud. And no matter where they are, the Texas diaspora, you know, we're out there. Uh, yeah, yeah. They see <laughs> Texas on a shelf and they'll buy it if they live in New York. Hell, I've know, met wherever. more Texans when I lived in Denver than I did when I lived in Dallas. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, okay. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, we okay. definitely love Colorado. Right, it's too right. hot in Texas. So, 
Uh, but interestingly enough, we've been pushing American single malt since 2008 when we started. Mm. Um, we were huge fans of Scottish single malt, and then now with the Japanese market being mm -hmm. um, putting out such quality uh, single malt, um, we feel like America is right there, kind of the, the next wave of single malt. Um, and we're, we're pushing this American single malt movement. And we've got our flagship, which is um, Texas One Single Malt. It's the one with the one on it. I don't have it today, but we, I do have the Lineage, which is our awesome. most recent release um, and our fastest growing uh, whiskey that we're selling right now. It is um, fun in that historically we've used 100% Golden Promise malted barley from Scotland, which is actually the malt we're using today with the beer that we're collaborating on. Um, but this whiskey is really fun for us because um, to answer your question about the, the evolution of Texas spirits, when we started in 2008, there was no Texas barley, there was no Texas malt. Mm. Um, just like uh, there were probably a handful of malt houses in all of the U.S. and people were pulling from those malt houses. Texas now has a couple of good malt houses. We're buying malt from Texas and we're using a combination of Texas malt and European malt to make this lineage product, um, this lineage whiskey. So. Uh, yeah, the development in terms of American single malt has grown in Texas and across the U.S., and really just the development of craft whiskey, craft grain, mm -hmm. uh, and, and that like sense of place and sense of local has grown a lot uh, over the last decade, That's for awesome. sure. Let me follow up with two, uh, yeah, two quick ones on that. Um, in Waco itself, I, I know the three of us are familiar with Waco. I don't know if you've been down there or spent any time there. I, I have. You have? Uh, yeah. I have a lot of family down in that area, but you know, it, most of the time that I spent down there was pre-16. Sure, so, sure. like, my, my, my uh, history of, like, adult life and drinking alcohol sure. and this, that, and the other is nil. Nil? Uh, okay. In that area. So then you can't... I'll... I'll Phrase the question this way, then. <laughs> yeah, uh, you're good. Yeah. Uh, so I'm curious, since you guys have really, I mean, you opened what you said, 08? That's right. when you opened. Um, you know, recently, as popularity's grown and all that, how have you seen Balconies kind of shape the culture or help with the culture, defining the culture in Waco, just specifically in Waco? Have, have you seen kind of a culture shift as things evolve? Sure. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're right downtown. Uh, we take up a full city block. And it's funny because, uh, you know, even five years ago, people, I, I'd go to the dentist and they'd say, where do you work? And I work at Balcones, we make whiskey. And they go, you make whiskey here in Waco? It's like, yeah, we've been here for a decade. Where have you been? Come on, I've yeah. been here my whole life. I didn't know there was a whiskey here in Waco. So over the last few years, we've, we've gotten bigger as people have started to, Waco's kind of become a tourist destination for reasons that are not Magnolia. our own. <laughs> there yep, you go. Yep. Over the last few years. The one but, and only. But yeah, so, so folks show up for Magnolia or for a Baylor football game mm. or for whatever it is. Yeah, and athletics are doing well down there. That's, yeah. that's a good call. That's a good call. Baylor yeah. football, Baylor basketball. Yeah. Just defending so, champions, that's all. <laughs> people yeah. will show up and, and they'll go, well, what else is there to do here besides the thing I came for? And they go, wait a minute, there's whiskey here and now beer here as well? And they show up and they see our tasting room and they go, this is incredible. So it really has shaped the culture in Waco in terms of um, just people's uh mm. the, the, the destination and, yeah, and what they yeah. think of when they think of waco so they may they may come to our distillery and then there's five other breweries in town that they may visit as well um that have opened in the last few years and so i think that the the culture has shifted a little bit more away from the no drinking no dancing <laughs> into a little bit more the baptist of culture yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. To it. Yeah. <laughs> jerusalem on the brass there you go. Like, there you i go. think people's minds are starting to open a little bit more about maybe seeing waco as a little bit more of a culinary destination mm. where we we traditionally have not been yeah, one that's awesome and then i love that label is there a, I feel like I should know this, and I feel like I've looked it up, but I can't remember it. The difference between whiskey without the E and with the E. Is it purely cosmetic, or is it, does it mean something? It's mostly cosmetic. Okay. So uh, European whiskey tends to be with no E. Because yours has no E if you can't see the actual label. It's yeah. a nod to uh, European styles of whiskey. So gotcha. most of what Balcones does with our, with our, uh, our branding choices has to do with uh, nods to uh, Scotch whiskey in particular. So our name, even Balcones, uh, it refers to the Balcones fault line that runs from uh -huh. from Mexico okay. all the way up to Oklahoma, actually, and um, runs through Central Texas. And traditionally, uh, Scottish distilleries have named themselves after a geological feature. Often, it's a lock, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, mm -hmm. you think Could of you say a, that in English for us? <laughs> <laughs> a, <lock. laughs> a, a lake? Uh, a lake? Yes. Uh, a glen, glen this, glen that, right? <laughs> right so, right. Uh, yeah. But for us, the geological feature that we were near was uh, the Balcones fault line. So that's that's, that's where awesome. our name comes from. So a lot of those are nods. The, the the whiskey with no e is certainly a nod to Scottish styles of 
of whiskey. And then, of course, the fact that we love American single malt has to do with the fact that we love malt whiskey. Um, Traditionally yeah. made in Scotland and now also all over the world, but especially in Japan and Taiwan and other places. I love that. Mm-hmm. So I'll yield the floor to you. I'm curious, do you want to go beer next or do you want to stay uh, with the spirits? L- let's let's cool the palate down Kay. and go beer. Go and with then, this beer because yeah. we'll end with the big one over A there. A really yeah. low ABV beer, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, you know, <laughs> something light, I easy drinking. I knew you were going to bring light. this beer. Oh, by the way, go ahead and talk about this real quick. Yeah, actually... Uh, <laughs> So yeah, we'll be this this flyers for our Shamrock Bash, which will be uh, not this weekend but the following on so the nineteenth. I'm gonna try to post this the day we record it, but March nineteenth in case. Yeah, so March nineteenth, which will be a Saturday, <laughs> it'll be super fun. If anybody has uh, come to a St. Patty's Day party at the brewery, it's a gas. It's awesome. We it's usually bring we usually bring in like th- at least three. Uh, three bands. We've got Irish dancers this year. We got, uh, uh, you know, uh, pipes uh, starting Kill off Kenny's the day. Is be there. Uh, Kill Kenny's will be there, which will be really cool. That's kind of a first. Yeah. Um, I didn't know they did things. And like that. we're going to be actually releasing an Irish stout uh, that day as well. So it'll be. It's it's just an awesome time. No cover, so, which is great. No cover. And you can family get this friendly. Beer when you come there. Yeah. Yeah. What beer did you bring? Uh, so we. I brought uh, the Hollows Triple, which is our uh, around, yeah. seasonal currently, uh, and so this this is actually the first time that we've released it to distribution, um, which is really really cool. We've ki- we we switched out another beer called Fog of War to move into the summer uh, to fit this one into the line because it has been and uh, is currently a taproom favorite and uh, one that a lot of people clamor for. Uh, you know my exactly. normal dislike of Belgian beers, but I've I've liked the majority of the ones you've brought. Maybe maybe, maybe you just had a really bad experience maybe. with some. <laughs> I, uh, because we started like when we first started the podcast, and like I know that's his background, and I was like, man, there's something about maybe it was, but it was just like the over raisiny, just like. I wasn't there. Was I'm like, with man. you. I've, I, I have historically also been yeah. burned by some yeah. uh, some bad Belgian beers. But yeah, coming up here this week to Tulsa, spending time with these guys, they're brewing some This is a Belgian really good beers. beer. Well, so thank yeah. you. I'll thank you very much. You. And what was the one that I really liked? The single? Uh, the single, yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think that you might have delved into enjoying, let's say not like, but Well, enjoying we know my allergies have changed. I'm now allergic to a lot of saisons. That was I the saison. allergy attack during oh, a podcast no. when he brought a saison. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Like it, but the the entire length of the podcast, I ran the gamut of the allergy attack. I was fine. I got stuffy, 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 and then I was fine. And so it was weird. Yeah, it was weird. <laughs> Something about the yeast, or so, I don't, I don't know. I don't know what it was. But anyway, I, got, I got to say, yeah. you know, personally, um, it's been r- really cool as a, a business owner and seeing these kinds of brands really come into fruition of what they are. Um, and really lean on my production crew um, because mm. t- typically right now, what do you think, David? I touch about 5% of the volume of beer right now. I'm working on making it 6%, but you're a busy yeah. guy. <laughs> 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 but it's been really cool because they, uh, you know, it might have been a dream child of mine in the past, but they really put out uh, the product and really is the reason why our, our, mm. uh, our beer tastes so great is because of their ab- ability yeah. to pay attention to detail. Shout out to Jonathan and cheers Jordan. Yeah. The boys are working right now. Yeah. <laughs> cheers. Yeah, cheers, cheers to that. Buddy. So uh, so Waco boys, uh, Tulsa has been on the rise in upcoming uh, towns of culture and music and uh, cocktails and beer and whatnot. Especially food now. Especially food. We've got a lot of James, uh, Beard, James Award, Beard Awards yeah. and nominees now. Uh, what is it like down in Waco? You, you kind of hinted at the, the culture is kind of getting a little bit richer. Uh, you're seeing that kind of filter into what it looks like down there. Um, from an outsider's perspective, I think of Waco as a dust bowl. Uh, with uh, very mm. flat lands. This is so good. This is so good. So Wh- where break, did the dust break bowl the, actually break the happen? Here, I know, right here. Yeah, I know. In Oklahoma. <laughs> but I mean, it, yes, the dust bowl happened here in Tulsa, where you know the earth got right, right. ripped from from the ground and blew around for a while. But Waco, I think, is still 
uh, that way. It's a very aggressive so, way to phrase that. <laughs> oh, I would love to put a framework around this just a little bit. Yeah, yeah. So, so break break that glass for me. Describe uh, where Waco is and uh, where you think it's going. Well, we used to say, oh, man, Waco's great. It's, it's uh, 80 minutes from Dallas, and it's 80 minutes from Austin, so it's great. Yep. That's, that, was the, that was the old selling point. <laughs> like, well, what about Waco, though? It was a waypoint. Well, you're missing a big selling point. So I live downtown right across the street from the Dr. Pepper Museum. Okay, yeah. Invented. Come on that's now. where it was defended. Come on now. Invented. That's right. I could get a float whenever I wanted one. That's right. And, and Baylor has historically been a selling point for those of us who went to Baylor, and for everyone else, not Sick a selling bears. point. Right on. Right. There you go. But yeah, uh, I think we talked a second ago about how Baylor's winning some, you know, a few the games here teams are hanging yeah. in there. Yeah. We're now we're now a, a tier one a research university, so Baylor's Baylor's getting up there. But uh, aside from Baylor, yeah, we've we've certainly the the demographic of Waco has shifted in such a way to where Austinites are being pushed out of Austin mm. by. Uh, Silicon Valley folks that are moving there. We've got uh, pretty soon the city limit of Austin will be South Waco. It, yeah, that's, Austin that's city about right. limits is only growing. <laughs> Honestly, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we have some people that are that are kind of more interested in something a little more interesting than just um, chicken fried steak and barbecue, which. Waco has great chicken fried steak and mm -hmm. great hole in the wall Mexican places, um, but we've certainly got some places now that are uh, doing excellent natural wines. Um, we're doing, uh, you know, chef driven, uh, chef owned restaurants, um, things like that that mm -hmm. just have not really been um, uh, part of Waco's history. And then, of course, every time uh, Waco gets almost to the point where uh, where we start to break through and, and, and our shining light finally peeks through, another tragedy just cover mm. <laughs> just covers it all up. So mm. yeah, Dust Bowl sounds about right. We've had our fair share of mishaps over <laughs> the years that we'd like to forget. Yeah. But yes. yeah, we're we're certainly moving towards uh, a future where uh, yeah, chef driven menus and uh, yeah, natural wine and and you know world class spirits and mm -hmm. beer. And I think that I think that we're getting there. A couple sure. places that come to mind, Milo in particular, across the street okay. from us. Um, a chef owned restaurant. He's phenomenal. Um, Guest Family Barbecue and Hellbird Barbecue, always on Texas Monthly's top top fifty for sure, even top ten this year. And then uh, yeah, hole in the wall Mexican places. Yeah, yeah. And there's so good. there's a few of those. The ones with the they're numbers on them are the best. <laughs> That's right. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's like this a, is a number menu, five. A menu like, oh. with pictures on it is yeah. always. This. I want that one. I have <laughs> dreams about a breakfast burrito that comes <sighs> off at twenty first in Lasker. Good okay. night. <laughs> I'm trying to think. I was there sometime around like 09 to 10 ish. Mm -hmm. And there was some, like, I think it was right in the beginning arc of, of that culinary expansion there. That's right. Um, but the thing I missed the most is when I would go home to Dallas and then come back, I had to go through West Texas. Oh, the Kalachis. And the Kalachis. Yes. The check stop in particular. Yes. Do you have not had a Kalachi? Because I don't know why the Czech population like centers in the country right there in little west comma texas um it's an important I mean, distinction you've got, for the you, record right it is yeah. you say west texas <laughs> you're like all the way out there no i mean west it's probably texas. because the germans all established down in austin mm. area that would make sense so the czech were like hey yeah. let's go over here <laughs> gotta be <laughs> nearby but not too close but not too close. <laughs> i mean that's world-class kalachis they're, they're, they're phenomenal. phenomenal it's unreal kalachis yeah, really are great <laughs> oh my word uh you said something about uh, how close is dublin to waco or is that uh, even not even? Minutes, maybe. Yeah, maybe, yeah less than an hour, take. I believe. Less yeah. than an hour. So that's where my family uh, was basically. Dublin, Dr. Peppers. I, I feel say, like a fat kid. Yeah. I'm talking Pepper. about sodas yeah. and kalachis all day. Yeah, Dublin, one Dr. brand Dr. of soda. You yeah. Really plug right. it. Right. Yeah, yeah, I grew up. I grew up going so to sponsor us, Dr. Pepper. I grew up growing or going to the Dublin plant, yeah. uh, a Dr. Pepper plant. Mm. Uh, where it was, you know, the real sugar those and little glass and bottles, and yeah. little glass cane sugar yeah. with those, mm -hmm. those New York Yankee pinstripes yep. <laughs> on right. the bottle. That's right. But, oh, but yeah, my cool. grandpa yeah. owned two different car dealerships in that town and two different grocery stores. Uh, so my that's where my my family mm -hmm. history is. So I I grew up going there and and drinking Dublin Dr Pepper. There's a lot that's of awesome. Texas at this day. There is a this lot. Is, of yeah. Texas this is a little scary. Table, yeah. Though though I am very true and true Tulsa. I just mm. want to put that out there. I'm born and raised here, and I have never lived in Texas. Mm. So you know, but my my family history comes from that area of the world. You don't have that's to funny. defend too hard. <laughs> you don't. You don't. <laughs> so I'm curious, where do you see Balcones headed? Like what's what's the future? What what direction is it trending? What what do you expect to see? What can we expect to see? You know, because we kind of talked about opening in 08 and then you know all the different things you've done up to this point. Where do you see it going? 
I'd say that if we were betting right now, we're betting and hoping and pushing for American Single Malt to uh, gain some prominence mm. nationwide, worldwide. Um, we definitely make bourbon, and we are definitely proud of our bourbon, and we think it's unique and interesting and high-quality stuff, and it's our bestseller. Mm -hmm. um, we are hoping and, and banking on American Single Malt, which we love, becoming the next big whiskey craze in America and the world. Mm. Um, we're laying down a lot of malt whiskey. It is more expensive to make. Malt is a lot more expensive than corn or rice or <laughs> wheat. Yeah, yeah. Um, but we think it tastes really, really good, and we think it's super compelling. So that's where we're headed, okay. is doing more and more American single malt whiskey. So for those listening that don't know the difference, sure, uh, both from a production standpoint, I mean, obviously we're talking about a single malt, but from a production standpoint, but also from a taste standpoint, how would you describe it to someone? Um, corn gives off the perception of sweetness. Mm. Um, no, no true distilled whiskey, unless it's back sweet, and unless unless there's sweetener added on the back end, is actually sweet because sugar doesn't carry through in the distillation process. But bourbon tends to come across a little bit sweeter, a because corn gives off this perception of sweetness, but b it's, it's aged in new oak, so you get wood sugar that sweetens up that spirit. Um, single malt, historically speaking, is aged in used oak, so a lot of those wood sugars have already come out mm. and gone to traditionally bourbon before the mm. Scotch producers finish their whiskey or age their whiskey in used bourbon barrels. Um, we did the same thing at Balcona as where we're using used oak. We use a little bit of new oak to add a little bit of sweetness. Um, as you can see, the, the color of this whiskey is a little bit darker yeah, than, than very much most so. Scotch whiskeys, but it's lighter than most bourbons. So it's kind of somewhere in between. It's kind of an introduction to the American palate of what you can expect from a malt whiskey, mm -hmm. um, but not quite going to the extreme of a Scotch whiskey that's much lighter. Um, so you get a little bit of sweetness here, but not as much as bourbon. Um, you get a little bit, in, in our opinion, you get uh, some more um, like delicious malt grain characters and less like corniness. Okay. Um, and then for us, our yeast tends to shine through too. And uh, the esters that we get from the from the brewer's yeast that we use, so we get a lot of stone fruit, we get a lot of cherry, um, and then we also get some components from the oak as well. You mentioned yeah. finish. Do you guys ever finish anything? We do. Yeah. Okay. So this 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 whiskey in particular um, has some, I believe, port fi finish and Madeira finish. Some of those barrels are in there. Um, we do rum finishes as well for our malt whiskeys. Uh, I mean, we, we, we try everything. That's awesome. <laughs> Which, done, by the way, we've done Calvados, we've done all sorts of stuff. We need to try it because yeah, we're on to the next, next oh, question. Yeah, that's up next. Yeah, yeah let's do it. So go ahead and open yeah. that up for us. <clears throat> that's interesting. Do you have a preference when it comes to finish? I guess for anyone, like for a, a finishing type, whether it's port, whether it's I mean, rum, whatever it is. Oh, um, you. you know, I don't know if I've ever really paid attention to it, to be yeah. quite honest. Uh, I love, I mean, obviously, I brought a rum. Yeah, I love rum, but for some reason the port in whiskey, I think goes really well. I don't know if I've had very many like specifically finished mm -hmm. uh, whiskeys that actually come to mind. Remind me, and I'll bring one for next week. Okay, yeah, episode. that'd so be we cool. Can try that. And it's subtle here, but we we actually finish uh, some of these barrels in our own peated malt whiskey barrels. Mm. Um, so there's a, a hint of peat in this whiskey, um, but if you're not looking for it, you won't find it. So okay. it's not as you know. The, the American whiskey drinker who's not used to drinking peat isn't going to get like a Laphroaig smoky, mm -hmm. like we're not going to get that character sure. on this. But if you're looking for that little bit of nuance, you'll get that little hint of peat there as well. That's really cool. And you'll certainly get that like oxidative character of a sherry or a Madeira finish as well because some of that's in there. I get what you're saying about the corn. That's really good. So yeah, the difference again between bourbon, lots of differences between bourbon and single malt, but Single malt is all malted barley. Um, bourbon is at least 51% uh, corn. Yeah, because you can usually taste much higher. it's not, because normally what I bring, right, the bourbons, right. you can taste the absence of that. And yeah, it's, sure. it's really interesting. Mm. Now remind me, this is a single malt? This is a single malt. So single malt in distilling refers to single being the one distillery. So... Um, Scottish single malts are malt whiskeys, 100% malted barley, that are distilled at one distillery. So a Jameson, for example, that's Irish, is a bad example. A um, uh, Johnny Walker is a blend from a lot of different distilleries. So it's not a single malt, it's a blended malt. Um, often in brewing, when we talk about a single malt, we talk about it being one malt, one grain. So 
Golden Promise, for example. That would be a single malt in, in, as a component of a single malt and single mm -hmm. hop smash beer, right? Um, conveniently for us, our single malt is distilled at one distillery, and it also happens to be one malt, which is Golden Promise. It helps those of us who aren't familiar with the lingo. Yeah, sure. Yeah, absolutely. And it's tough switching back and forth between two different, completely different sets of lingo, but yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll be here to translate. Yeah. That's really cool. <laughs> what do you think? What's your palate say? Man, it's really cool. It has. It's totally different than what we normally normally have. Yeah, it bounces off the tongue a little bit different. Dances it, on the it tongue. It dances. A little bit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't. I don't want to call it gritty, mm -mm. Um, mm -mm. because that's not necessarily what it is. It. It. But you can actually, like, really taste the husk of the malt. You can. You can taste that earthiness, but also at the same time, it's balanced by what you're talking about within the background. You've got a little bit of that smoke character that brings in uh to me that's depth. the finish like yeah that just, would be the finish lingers. yeah yeah uh so yeah. it has a whole like probably mm. a three-step mm -hmm. uh depth within your palate and enjoyment of that liquid it's really cool we like to think about the the kind of the story the whiskey tells from the from the nose all mm -hmm. the way through the finish um, and we're super proud of the fact that we don't chill filter any of our whiskeys. Mm. And so they're, they're a little bit more rich and a little bit more oily because we're not stripping that out in the finishing process. Um, we're not chilling it down and stripping out those oils. We're leaving them there. We kind of think about it as like if you're cooking and you've got all these spices and it's missing something. And you so throw is that, that the viscousness that you get it all together. because you didn't? Exactly. Okay. A little bit more viscous. Yeah. And then we I think also. That that's what I was trying to describe. It's not yeah. gritty. It's just it came. I, I pulled that out of thin yeah. air. But it kind of yeah. coats yeah. the palate yeah. a little bit. And uh -huh. It just kind of yep. stays there on your palate. Yeah. It's also a little bit higher ABV than than most off the shelf whiskeys. It's forty seven percent ABV. Okay. So um, anything below yeah. forty six percent, you have to chill filter, or it'll get a chill haze. Mm. Um, so we don't bottle anything less than forty six percent ABV. And then our standard single malt, our our flagship Texas One single malt at fifty three percent ABV. Okay. So it's it's a little bit higher than most. So you, you get a little bit more uh, concentration of flavor than you would if you were to proof it down further. But we also, of course, encourage everyone to add water to your preferences. Sure. Which I failed. I did not bring us any water. So if anyone was wanting some, that's, no that's on me. I drink it cast We're just drinking all the time. All right. yeah, we'll have yeah. to water it down with the triple. Is that what I heard? Yeah, there you go. Yeah, <laughs> That's not Let's right. try that out. Sure, see what happens. <laughs> It's like people try to make poor man's pappy these days, where it's like oh, no, 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 forty no, no. percent Weller antique, and then like sixty percent Weller antique or Weller Special Reserve right. to antique or whatever it is. Oh, there's all sorts I mean, of formulas yeah, out there. Yeah, you can you can try. I mean, the, the triple and the single malt. I wouldn't Let dare. us know how it tastes. I wouldn't dare. Yeah. <laughs> oh my word! Well, uh, goodness, am I already on a last question? Is it three for you or two for you? I think it's two for you. No, it's three because I started. Yeah. Uh, this is my last question. Oh, it is. Which is really crazy. We're we're oh, going we just sit really and talk to. So we'll I'm impressed with y'all structure. This is amazing that you're keeping track of your questions. This well, yeah. obviously bad. I thought it was the <laughs> second, <laughs> <laughs> just third. So <laughs> well, bringing her back around yeah. to uh, why both of you are sitting here. Um, tell one. Tell us why uh, why you're here in Tulsa and how that became for Balcones and what your position kind of. Uh, molded into and uh, why you know David and David why you know Dustin I'm going to answer the question that I think you're asking but I wasn't quite sure well you I'm can trying, try, it so I'm trying to right allude question. to that Balcone is is now brewing and that Thank is God. why there you're here is. got it yeah <laughs> how did how did that become to be in uh, your history within that role uh, and uh, how that how your history with David got you to Tulsa? Totally, yeah. So David and I know each other from Baylor. Um, we've been we've been friends for quite a while, and I think uh, you know a while ago, uh, I think probably when we were both in seminary together, uh, studying theology. I think that we both which naturally it naturally leads to a career in alcohol. Of course. <laughs> how how many of your friends that Baptist were seminary. in <laughs> were in seminary with you guys that are now in alcohol production? Oh man, because it's it's quite a few. There's right? a lot of us, yeah. What is the correlation there? So uh, <laughs> I think that we all know no that uh, Jesus yeah, was that a proponent <laughs> of... He turned water uh, to wine. Exactly. I mean, he was a on. proponent of alcohol and, and moderate usages. <laughs> uh, and so we followed his lead. Right on. And now we turn water into spirits. So you're doing the Lord's work. That's right. Doing the Lord's work. Yeah. 
if we could only make it as efficiently as he did, there's yeah. no way. Uh, it's I'm, miraculous. Yeah, exactly. Just miraculous. Yeah, quit trying to be divine. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't it be nice? Wouldn't it be nice? So I think we uh, we we both thought, you know, uh, eight years ago or whenever we were in seminary, that it, man, it would be cool to brew beer. But like, how do you even do that? You know, like I was in Waco, Texas. You don't get to brew beer in Waco, Texas eight years ago. You don't just get to walk into a tap room like this guy in Tulsa and uh, and get a job in a brewery. So uh, I think both of us very happily kind of stumbled into this dream uh, dream scenario where we both get to work in, in beer. Uh, five years ago, I started working for Balcones. Um, a, another former seminary buddy of mine is the distillery manager at Balcones. At the time, he was the brew house manager. And I have an undergraduate degree in biology, and he went, hey, biology, fermentation management, yeast, you can handle this. And so he hired me to do that. And um, I made whiskey for three years. And then two years ago, we started making beer because we like beer. And, uh, and fortunately, we're in a situation where our owners are supportive of that and invested the money to get us a, a brew system, and we supply our tap room. And, uh, and then, yeah... I, about a year ago, you started brewing at, at Cabin Boys, and and uh, two years ago, two years yeah. ago, yeah. Oh gosh, COVID! It, it You're was gonna add a year yeah. for COVID. Yeah. Yeah, I, we all forget COVID. I <laughs> slingshotted here. him. I slingshotted him onto the brew stand without question it was during the most COVID. Terrifying day of my alcohol career. <laughs> <laughs> I actually was uh, learning a lot in in the cellar, learning a lot about cleaning takes and fermentation, and and I was. Sitting talking with my wife and was saying, hey, I really could use X amount of time here and then I might get comfortable with exactly what I'm doing and be able to teach people and train to be in my role. And then the next day I go into work and Austin's like, great, get up on the brew stand. <laughs> That's basically how it happened. <laughs> The great news is that, you know, being from Texas, we, we love Kolsch in Texas. Mm -hmm. We've got St. Arnold Fancy Lawnmower is kind of like... Good one a classic Texas uh, craft beer, right? That green can. And then now you've got St. Elmo doing Carl Kolsch. And mm. we just, we love like refreshing lighter beers. And so David's like, oh, I'm working for this Cabin Boys now in Tulsa. Check out this blue can. It's got this delicious <laughs> Kolsch in here. And man, I was like, you lucked out. How the <laughs> heck did you, man, how did you do it? Turns out all you got to do is knock on some doors and shake some hands. Interrupt and, and some <laughs> brew days. And, yeah. and a good deal of luck. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, we, we met, I think, at last year's CBC. Yeah. So, so what is CBC? Craft Brewers Conference yeah. happens every year. Uh, last year it was in uh, Denver. And uh, I was looking for David because we're old buds. And he said, great, we're going to meet with Austin and Lisa. And you, I, you guys got to, you know, y'all will be buds. And sure enough, we caught up at cohesion and it was a blast mm. and uh yeah we just said man we got to get together and brew some beer i think we got similar mindsets on what what kind of things we like to drink and how we like to brew and we got on a phone call a few weeks ago and started chatting about what we wanted to brew and man we just boom 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 it was really easy yeah super easy that conversation was easy. <laughs> so what else can you tell us about the foray into brewing for balcones like can you can you give us some more details on what that's going to look like Sure. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, you know, I'd like to say, oh yeah, you know, sky's the limit. You right. know, we're going to, we're, we're going to use our distribution network and we're going to go international. But the reality is most of what we do is focused on what we actually have been doing for 14 years, which mm -hmm. is whiskey, particularly American single malt whiskey. The, the beer side has a lot to do with the fact that the people that work at Balcones like beer and we like this sense of experimentation where we can try something and get feedback within a month. Whiskey's tough because you're looking at a two to 10 year timeline, depending on what kind of experiment you're undertaking. And so we get to try things on a smaller scale. We get to um, see people in our tap room who need to take a break from their, you know, that maybe they've had two pours of whiskey and they want to dial it back and have mm -hmm. a lager for a second. We get to keep them around and continue to have the conversation about malt and grain mm -hmm. and production. Um, so it kind of serves a unique purpose for us that really doesn't have a lot to do with growing the business or expanding the the, the beer side of things. So you may not see it in Tulsa ever, but well, uh, you have to, to come to, to Waco to get it. <laughs> Turns out you will see a Balcones brand in hey, Tulsa at right. the end of this fermentation, which that's is exactly right. 
PBD because <laughs> fermentation. Yeah, oh, it's SO4. Know. We could almost say next week. Yeah. We'll <laughs> <That's funny. laughs> so as far as the the tap list, once you once you come into the distillery, are you you said lager? Are you sticking to like pilsners and lagers and the lighter beers? Or are you going to do some you know barrel aged stouts and some big boys as well? Sure. Yeah. Right now we only have four taps. Okay. And they're hardly ever the same. Um, we have brewed. Uh, probably 70 batches of beer, and I think 60 of them oh, have see, been different beers. I didn't know it was beers. already going. I thought it was upcoming. So you're already doing We've it. We've been doing gotcha. it for about... Gotcha. So, yeah, we, we, uh, we released our first beer on February 29th. Easy to remember because it's a leap day of 2020. So okay. Uh, okay. weeks before COVID yeah. shut down. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah, so we've been doing this two years now. Uh, we've been brewing a little bit less than once a week since then, and we... We rarely brew the same batch of beer that we've brewed before. Mm -hmm. So we're getting to the point now. We've kind of gotten it all out of our system, and we're revisiting some of the favorites. But, yeah, we try to keep a lager on hand or a Kolsch. Um, we try to keep a barrel-aged beer on hand, mm -hmm. usually a stout, sometimes a barley wine. And then we, we try to keep at least one hoppy beer on hand, whether it be an IPA, a hazy IPA, or some sort of sure. session IPA. What's the feedback then? People love it. Yeah, we've got a handful of places around town that are asking us for, for beer. Um, We've got places that are outside of town that ask us for beer, and we just have to say, we're not driving over there. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. If you buy some of our whiskey, then we might like, deliver uh, it. We, we got people in town who want it, and we don't have that much beer. So, yeah, yeah there's just, again, we're, 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 we're trying to focus as much as we can on the whiskey, and, and the beer is mostly just to kind of scratch that itch sure. that, that we have of, of just kind of creators and makers of, like, making another thing with a short feedback loop yeah. that we get excited about and love. That's, yeah. that's awesome. Cool. So before I ask the last question, I think we need to. Do you need a bottle opener yeah, for that? Yeah. And historically known as not the best. You want to hand that to I, me, bud? Yeah. I'll open this. I have to chug my nine percent. Somebody was gonna pour it to me. Beer. I didn't you pour it into my glass for that reason. Mm -hmm. I was like, I'm gonna drink it out of the can just because I don't know if I'm gonna finish it in time. Yeah, I, I said you and me both, Austin. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Let's see here. See if I can get it. About this beer, uh, I brought this beer. Um, uh -oh. and yeah, it, it might spill a little bit. It is uh, my favorite stout that we've put out. Okay. The Barrel Age Stout, it is a part of our Mrs. Stoutfire brand, uh, which is our high AB uh, Imperial Stout with brewed with Arbol chilies. Uh, this particular liquid is brewed in 2020 and then put in Rye Whiskey Woodford Reserve barrels. Uh, for a number of months. I think it's on the bottle. Uh, we yeah, put know. out a few beers since then. I think um, at least 13. I yeah. think it says 13 on the barrel, on, on the bottle. Trust the print. Yeah. Uh, it is, um, I hesitate to say this because we put out a lot of good beers, but good night. This is my favorite stout that we have put out. It, um, I'm looking for napkins, but we really don't have good. any. I'm just messy over here. It's okay. You gotta use sleeves. I know, right? Like with my white <laughs> shirt. White yeah, sleeves. yeah. I'll just. Yeah, we're okay. <laughs> so this was part of Stout Fest, right? Yeah, Stout Fire yeah. Fest from Stout Fire Fest, a few yeah. years ago, and then again we had it on tap this year, um, and it's mm. just it's just so good. We had it on tap and in bottles, so. Yeah, it's a really fun one. I think, uh, from a production standpoint, this is. Our production's favorite stout fire that's been made. I think the consensus is yeah. yes. I'm going to um, say this, and I don't know how to say it without it coming across probably not how as I mean it. I'm so excited. But I'm going to say it anyway. I You're think, speaking David's language right now. I think stouts are my favorite style of beer that you guys brew. Oh, that's cool. really cool. That's yeah. awesome. I, I know you hang your hat on some other things as well, but like every version of stout fire I've had is amazing. Like, it's just really, really good beer. Which is really, I mean, that's a cool compliment uh, because we do hang our hats more more or less on Kolsch, mm -hmm. Cerveza. That's why I didn't want it to be a slight to those no, beers. No, 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 no. But, uh, but we, only yeah. make, we only make this once a year, mm. and uh, it's, it's really fun that that can be a compliment to what we do because uh, stouts aren't necessarily, I wouldn't necessarily say something that we're not passionate about, but mm -hmm. it is it's is something that we don't do very often, so we get really excited when it when it actually does uh, get released. Definitely, yeah. I'd agree with that. It's w our our passion is obviously in the product on the stout, uh, and it comes around this particular mm -hmm. 
beer brand comes around once a year and we get really jazzed about it and then we brew it and then we look forward to the spring with the pilsners and then the summer with our double ipa re- release and then we look towards our fest beer and then we look up and it's time to brew stout fire again and we get excited and then we <laughs> yeah. also realize oh we've got this in barrels and Man, what do this, we do with we're it? pulling nails on ah. this and this might be the best <laughs> You know, stout we put out yeah. yet, and it, it just that time of year is really fun. It's almost like March Madness, but for stouts. Hey, it, it is um, March Madness. Yeah, good call. Well, Baylor Bears. With the amount of stouts that we had to sell this yeah. year for Stout Fire Fest, it felt like March Madness. Somebody needed a bracket <laughs> on that. <laughs> All right. So, last question. I want to. I want to bring it back to kind of the the culture realm. And you said something earlier that kind of piqued my curiosity because you're right. Like. For a long time, Waco wasn't a place that you would associate with alcohol, right? And so I feel like opening in 08, Balcones has been like on the leading edge of changing that culture within the city. And so I'm curious, in in a more macro, you know, broad sense, how do you personally see or or how can the hospitality industry, the beverage industry, whatever it is, help to shape the culture of? of cities and states and regions? Because I think obviously they can. Sure, yeah, I think that... And that's a big question. Uh, so you can break it down or however you want to answer it. Yeah, yeah it's, it's tricky because a lot of times we talk about um, at Balcones in general and then our, at Balcones in particular and then in the hospitality industry broadly, we talk about education as a very important piece. Um, and that's something that I you know, has been part of the conversation for at least a decade now, from my experience, I'm sure much longer. But the tricky part of that, too, is that you don't want to talk down to a consumer right, and tell right. them, like, oh, well, this is why. Like, you don't think they know. Or whatever. Yeah, like, yeah, you, yeah. you just like bourbon. You should try American single malt. Like, that's a ridiculous proposition. You're not going to win people over that way. And so it's this tricky dance where we have to embrace that we are Wacoans and we're Texans and we're whatever we are. Um, and, and it's not them that are Wacoans or Texans. It's, it's us that are Wacoans and Texas, and, and we're all kind of evolving in this together. And while we very much want for American Single Malt to, quite honestly, dominate the landscape, mm-hmm. um, we're not trying to force that down anyone's throats either. Like, if people don't like it, people don't like it. We, we like it, and we're going to keep making it because we like it. Um, but, yeah, I think that there's a, 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 the hospitality piece there the presentation is just that, hey, we're makers and we're out here trying to do something that we're proud of and that we find compelling and interesting. And because we're all people, we're pretty sure we can talk to you about why we are excited about it. And mm-hmm. you'll probably get excited about it too because it's honest. Yeah. You know, It's an honest, earnest expression of creativity. And we think that you'll probably be able to get on board with that too. You know, the more, cool. the more times we ask questions like that, <clears throat> I'm starting to realize that consistency has a lot to do with it. Mm-hmm. That like if... Well, and uh, the consistency of their passion as well. Well, but you can, uh, yeah, you could take that a bunch of different ways. Where mm-hmm. I was going with it was, you know, if if you're trying to instill or change the culture of a place and people view you as a flash in the pan and you, you say something or you're here for a minute and then you're gone, that's not going to have the same effect as what you're talking about, like the truthfulness and the earnestness and you're just doing what you love and what you want other people to love and you're consistent with it and you're constantly there. I think then it becomes, okay, well, these guys aren't going anywhere, so let's go see what it's about right. type of thing, right? Yeah. And then maybe slowly over time, <laughs> as in Waco's case, you go from no alcohol to having distilleries and breweries and, and whatever else. Yeah, yeah. exactly. What, uh, David, do you have any points of uh, thought on... Yeah, you were deep in thought cat- there. Now you got to come uh, back and answer of, something. Of I'm how such <laughs> a good listener. <laughs> no, <laughs> of how it's all in my eyes. So listening to what Dustin's saying, can you add a little bit of a fold of what do you think uh, Cabin Boys and why people keep coming back to it or why we're um, considered, I think that we're considered a, uh, a company that has enriched the, the community with, within our neighborhood, but why do you think that that's going to continue in your own words and where your passion is within our four walls down the street. Yeah, uh, Cabin Boys, um, man. Uh, the fun thing about beer is that when you're doing beer right, uh, you are present for a communal moment. Uh, beer in its best moments isn't about 
um, anything but the conversation across the table. It's here as a facilitator to bring humans together, experiencing each other for the betterment of each other. Um, and wow. when we're on our well best, said. well, when we're, it was the, actually, good. if you drink more rye 2020 stout fire, the smarter you get, it just, no. <laughs> Also, uh, he's a theologian, so whoa, wow. bearded. Oh, bearded as well. <laughs> Once oh, there it is. <laughs> I'm not the bearded theologian, if anyone is familiar with uh, our a, Belgian quad. Just I, a, a just bearded theologian. Well, bearded I'm just theologian. Cabin Boy's bearded theologian in residence. That's right. Going That's right. on four, four years? Whoa. In November, it'll be four years. Oh, yes, it will be. Um, wow. I... I uh, Regrettably, have uh, decreased in my theological acumen in the last four <laughs> years. Probably hey, because no. of the amount of stout fire that you've consumed. Maybe. Uh, uh, well, yeah, we could digress <laughs> for a we've, while we've on had why. Some, but we've had some very theological discussions definitely. in the back, especially when it was COVID. Uh, mm. Especially when we were <laughs> holding on, just white knuckling to uh, cabin boys because everybody had a hard time in COVID. Yeah. Um, but, but get back to what you yeah, were saying. Yeah, sure. So uh, at its best moments, we're, we're here to facilitate uh, just honest relationships and, uh, and, and humans becoming better humans. And so uh, within the Kendall Whittier District, that is our goal. We want to make beer that brings people, uh, if you're coming to our tap room, brings people to a location that cares about the people who live near us. Um, and we want to make beer that uh, wherever you are, whether you're in Tulsa, Oklahoma, whether in Catoosa, whether you're in Oklahoma City, uh, if you drink Cabin Boys beer, there's someone right across from me and you're having a conversation that uh, both of you are going to become a little bit better. Mm. And that starts with our farmers, and we get to facilitate a little bit of that with uh, what we do at uh, whatever our address is. 1717 E7th Street. <laughs> How do you forget that one? That's an easy one. I, I've moved too many times. Like I told you, yeah. my dad was a high school football coach in Texas. I've seen a few addresses. Yeah, yeah well. That's um, true. But, yeah, so I, I really do think – so Austin and I, uh, back in September, got back from a, a phenomenal craft brewers conference where uh, we were – um, guided through some discussions on what it looks like to uh, care about the community well. And it mm. impacted Austin, Lisa, and I in some some beautiful ways. And so we want to continue that dream at Cabin Boys, which essentially is facilitating things that we see happening already in Tulsa. That's awesome. And to continue to be a part of that. So I can't well let our first Cabin Boys employee be on the podcast without asking for some dirt. On, when I turned my hat backward. <laughs> yep. That was so, for the those watching the video yes, on yes, YouTube. Yes. So I need a funny, your your favorite, preferably embarrassing, um, Austin McElroy story. So <laughs> I'm historic. So the only person at this table that's got me long enough is well, you know, actually I've been around long enough that everybody knows I'm terrible on the spot. <laughs> So and I, I did just totally I need put at least you on the spot. Forty-five minutes to come up Ooh, with something that good. long. Yeah, I no, can't give you true, that. It's true. You might have to come back on the podcast again. But <laughs> do you have some? I've never asked you this. Do you know what you thought he was going to say? Like, is there is there That's a moment good. that you were like, oh, I probably did something stupid, or he caught me dancing in the back? I mean, who knows what? I like, do that anyway. No, yeah, no, no. Dancing say, yeah. is on the regular. Okay. Yeah. yeah no, that, no, no, no. Well, I was trying to. Be okay. Here, I got you. Okay. Okay. Here we so, go. oh, oh let's see if I can remember all of the names and the albums. Ooh. Oh, you're okay. gonna help me because I'm gonna need help because go my it. memory <laughs> is as good as. <laughs> Sorry, no, you're good. <laughs> so uh, I'm ready for it. Yeah, we uh, we have a canning line at Cabin Boys Brewery. I don't know if you have had anything that we've had done from a can. Oh, yep. right. No, yeah, okay. even here I mean, today. Right here. Maybe, maybe <laughs> uh, the right so here. Uh, it turns out people have to run that canning line. Mm. And uh, so I started running the canning line. I don't know. Um, it's been a while. And uh, I quickly realized that I needed I needed some help. And so I had never actually seen Austin. This is I'm embellishing a little bit, but it's for the story. I had never seen Austin McElroy run the canning line. That's just not true. But uh, there came a moment where while I was running the canning line, it might have been during COVID, uh, that I needed some help. And Austin said, I'm, I'm your man. I will pack out. I will put these six packs in the case trays. And I only have one condition 
it's that I control the radio. I was like, yeah, that's great. Yeah, you control the radio. And all of a sudden... Um, this might be embellishing because I don't know if I've said that. Oh, no. I like it. I like it. I like it. So much right I like it. <laughs> so we wake up. We're there at 7 a.m. and Billy Joel is on the radio. Ooh, yeah. And piano we, man. we Great sing ball. through. No, no, oh, no, no. I know Piano that. Man. Okay. Which ones did you go This with? is so far back that I've, I am... I can sing the words, all the Billy Joel radio <laughs> hits. I can do it. But he was going deep cuts? Deep cuts. Oh, okay. And I've never heard an angel sing. <laughs> and I'm not sure that I have even now, but Austin was great. <laughs> and those Billy Joel <laughs> cuts were just, they were, they got us through COVID. And they made some of the best beer that, man, it was just, it was good. You know how like some places, some distilleries will age their, their, whatever it is, their product with classical music playing so that it bounces off. That our, our beer is made to build angelic, <laughs> angelic vocal cords. Those of you Austin that McElroy. got those cans in late 2020 were just <laughs> drinking something special. Oh, so what, what's your Billy Joel infatuation? Uh, River of Dreams. And it's good. Album. Okay. Uh, Which one is that? I think it's 1991, his last album that he released. So there weren't any like mainstream, huge Billy Joel hits off that album, were there? Um, to me, yes. <laughs> I think it was written specifically for me. <laughs> but you know the ones I'm talking about, the ones that everyone knows, right? Like those no. were prior to that. So oh, way I, prior. I didn't, yeah. I didn't know any of these okay. songs okay. before yeah. 2020, and I, now I, don't I know. sing them to my wife. Yeah, and I, she I, tells I, me to stop. <laughs> <laughs> That's but that fair. has nothing to do with <laughs> Billy Joel, only oh, to my fair, vocals. Fair, fair. <laughs> oh. Yeah, that, that, uh, yeah. So I'm going to have to contact someone and see if we can't get our intro music changed to some Billy Joel to track Billy Joel, from River that of album. Dreams, yeah. yes. Huh. Yep. Yeah, yeah, I'll yeah. try that. All right, I'm going to put you on the spot now. Before we let you go, when can people visit Balconis? When is the distillery open as far as do you do tours, all that kind of stuff? Give us the, the pitch on when people can come see you. We are open. I'd like to say seven, but I think it's six days a week okay. um, in our tasting room. We do neat pours. We do cocktails. We do beer. Um, we do wine. We do Do you make tours. the wine? Yeah. Or do you just sell the wine? We legally have to make some of the wine. Therefore, they send you the wine and you store it in your place and then you serve it. We so uh, the great thing about Oklahoma's being, the same way. In that <laughs> I'm learning way. something right yeah. now. The great thing about being a wine producer in Texas is that you can buy anyone's wine and sell anyone's wine. Uh. So we have an excellent selection of natural wine from David Mayfield Selections. Um, beautiful wine, beautiful vermouth, um, and that vermouth, vermouth goes in our cocktails yeah. as well. So yeah, we do cocktails, wine, beer. Um, we're open Monday through Saturday. Okay. And our uh, still in Waco, gotta be closed on Sunday. Oh, sorry, Tuesday uh, through Saturday, Tuesday okay. through Saturday. Uh, okay. But our gift shop is open still on Mondays as well, and so you can buy bottles to go, you can buy merch. Um, yeah, our, our, our cocktail program is phenomenal. Shout out to Don and Andrew, That's those awesome. guys have done amazing work at Balcones. Um, and then, yes, tours most of those days, if not all those days, Tuesday, Tuesday through Saturday. What do the tours consist of? Uh, Full, full, full walk around of the distillery, explain how we make the whiskey from the silos all the way to the bottle, um, packaging awesome. line, barrels, you see it all. Um, it's a really, really cool tour. Um, if you come early enough in the day on Friday or Thursday, I'll be there. I'll wave at you. There it is. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Tell and them yeah, the tasting room since It you. comes with <laughs> tastings as well. Um, yeah, it's, it's a really, really cool experience, especially for folks that are just like, there for Magnolia or a Baylor basketball game, and they're like, what else is in town? And then they get to come see this full-on distillery experience, and they're like, this is incredible. That's so, awesome. yeah, please please come and visit us. Uh, yeah. We need to take a road trip. Yeah, we need to go down there. Come go on. down through Dallas. Well, we're going to... Stop by there. Uh, go to Austin. A little, little, yeah. little foreshadowing to the future of this collaboration. The Cabin Boys uh, production team is going to go down to Balcones. Okay. And oh, so you, yeah, that's right. When people do and that, you go to both places. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it'll be a here, there. We're, mm -hmm. we're going to be brewing here. What they don't know at Balcones is the production crew is going to take over the distilling side <laughs> for a day. Ooh. And uh, we're going to blend uh, a few barrels together and release it without them knowing. So, you know, this will be unlabeled bottles pushed uh, on the secondary market. We've got a secondary. whole plan. It's okay. two of us will be brewing, and the other two will be running and like covering eyes and cameras. <laughs> like we're just like, 
Our Subterfuge. distillers and blenders are going to love that idea. Yeah, that's a <laughs> great <laughs> idea. Please. Yeah. Please. Give me one day where I can take a break. I've we'll got to bring plan, two we'll cases of beer for yeah. the distillers and the blenders. Right. We can plan this out off, off yeah. camera, but going down and maybe getting your master distiller on and, and do a second really. one while we're down there. Just bring yeah. some microphones and a couple cameras. Mm-hmm. And totally. Knock but it yeah, out. That might be fun. Yeah. But we will actually be brewing a beer down there, That's which awesome. will be really cool. Yeah. Well, guys, thanks for coming in. Yeah, I appreciate absolutely. you taking time. Safe yeah. travels through the uh, weird winter weather in March. <laughs> yeah. Tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> hey, sometimes you got it anything happens. in there? You got one sip I'm left, good, right? Yeah. Texas and Cheers. Oklahoma have that in common. Bizarre that weather. True. <laughs> That's right. And horrible driving in it. That's right. Golly. All right, guys. We'll be back after the break. And that is Dustin and David, Cabin Boys and Balcones Distillery down in Waco, Texas. That was a lot of fun. That was so fun. Yeah. First Goodness. time I brought something other than bourbon. Yeah, brought, brought which was run. really cool. Uh, yeah. uh, you know, <laughs> the funny thing is, is when <laughs> I drank it for the first time, I haven't had rum in, goodness, probably a year. Really? So after all of this bourbon, mm-hmm. after all of uh, th- this hit the palate, really, really sweet. Yeah, very vanilla to me. Yeah, really and vanilla. even in 119.4, that proof hits different yeah, rum it, to bourbon. It had a little bit more, like, chocolate character to it mm-hmm. to me. Yeah, it was, it was really cool. And then but this one... Shining moment yeah, for that. Yeah, the lineage from Balcones is, uh, if you like scotch, you'll love this. It, it does have that lingering, that viscosity is what we talked about, that, that peatiness in the back end, but it's not a but lot. It's, it's, it's just it's enough to be like, hey, this isn't normal bourbon. It's more yeah. soothing than anything. Yeah, yeah. Which is really, really cool. It, uh, I've tried to describe it at first as like this, uh, like a grittiness on your tongue, which is completely That's probably incorrect. the wrong way to say that. Yeah, yeah but it's like a coating <laughs> to your... To grittiness. Your, yeah. such a I, it's just, I didn't know what to say. Grittiness <laughs> is probably not the answer. <laughs> no, no, no. Which makes it sound bad. No, it's oh, really, really good. Oh, that's so funny. <laughs> hey, if people come to the Shamrock Bash and mention the tasting room, can we give them something? Ooh, can we give them we, a free drink or something? We we can work something out. So if you mention the tasting room and you come to Shamrock Bash, I will get with our operations manager and see what you can get. I just put them on the spot. I thought could of be, it as I was sitting here. It could be like a dollar off your yeah. your first round or something like that. It can't be free beer. Oh, you can't do that? Can't do that. That's okay. an enticing. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, can't do that. Abel, I didn't but say we'll, that. But we'll... we'll yeah. We'll work something out. That's cool. Yeah, if you if you mention Tasting Room, we'll give you a, a, a little something at our, our Shamrock Bash. There it is. And I know who our next guest is going to be. I normally don't, which is behind the curtain why I'm usually like, I'm not going to tell you who our new guest next guest is. You're just going to have to figure it out. I know who the next guest is now. That's right. The one and only Jake Miller. and uh, From Heirloom Rustic Ales. That'll be next week. And yep. yeah, I'm excited to have... Uh, and he's excited too. He was on the phone when I asked him if he, he could come down. He was like, oh yeah. Yeah, that sounds really fun. So he and I talked about it a, a couple weeks ago, and uh, there's just so many, you know, facets to Jake that, and we don't have to get into that. We'll get into that next week. But you know, his love of the outdoors, his advocacy for for fishing and sustainable fishing, and and just so many different things, along with the beer that he brews. And yeah, and his practice of brewing beer is wildly the absolute opposite of what I do, yeah. but also has a lot of the same. He has brewed really cool. beer using something from my yard. Okay, that's cool. I'm going to leave it at that. That's a tease. We'll see you next week on The Tasting Room. Cheers.